We have a question from a client asking about their level 20s. Uh-huh. They're making about 500K and that's uh, gross net, probably about 300K. What are some good effective tax planning strategies for them to take? What are some good suggestions? Okay. So after expenses, they have 300 grand. That's the basic yes. idea? Yes. Okay. And, and you said it's an S-corp? Okay. So you're already doing one step right, which is the S-corp. Um, S-corp is a particular tax status as far as companies go and it files its own tax return and the net profit at the end of the return is going to have, it's going to flow through to the individual owners and the individual owners pick up that income. But importantly, they get QBI treatment, which is a special deduction created by the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. And they get, they get to take that income without self-employment tax. So a partnership, same kind of thing, but you have to pay self-employment tax, which is Social Security and Medicare. S-Corp, you don't. So important difference. It's a 15.3% difference. So that, so step one, you're already doing right. So as far as after that, how do you uh, how do you manage that? And actually, before we even get there, this is um, that's a little bit high on the on the expense side because if if you're bringing in 500 and you're left with 300, that means you spent 200, right? So 200 on 500 is 40%. So your operations level is operations expense is 40%, which is a little high uh, for a small business. Generally, you want to see that 30, 35% maybe at, at that level, but uh, that's a side thing. All right. So now we got 300 grand uh, a year. And how do we do, how do we take care of that? There are, there's a million tax strategies, but there's some, a couple of basic categories. One of them is structuring and that's putting things into an S-Corp or C-Corp or a partnership or whatever it is. So you got the S-Corp piece already. That's good. Second step is cash management. And that is going to involve what I like to call cash flow neutral strategies. And those are going to be reimbursement strategies and using a meetings plan and uh, taking care of medical expenses and a, a few other things that fall into that category where you are reimbursing yourself in a tax advantaged way. It's a little bit beyond the scope of this call to get into how all that works. But basically, when you have when you have business expenses that are coming out of your personal pocket, you get reimbursed from that or reimbursed reimbursed for that from the company. Uh, you can have uh, uh, a meetings plan where you are using your primary residence for a business uh, meeting. You can do that up to 14 times a year. You can... You can do things with medical expenses. You can potentially do things with education expenses. You can, depending on your facts and circumstances, if you have kids in the right range, you can put them on payroll with through a different entity. So there, there's a lot of different things. And that's all using the income and expenses that you already have, but just recharacterizing the flows into a more tax advantaged way. So that's that's the first set of things. And after that, then we get into salary optimization. One of the magic things that was introduced with the Tax Cut and Jobs Act was the Qualified Business Income Deduction, QBI. And this gives you up to a 20% disc, or a 20% uh, deduction on pass-through income, like from S-Corps. So it's, the math is complicated, but basically if you're under a certain threshold, depending on the, your filing status, then you get a 20% flat rate deduction. If you're over a certain threshold, depending on your filing status, then there becomes a comparison between 20% of the income versus the wages that were paid that by that company. And so there's some optimization to be done there because on the wages side, you're going to have payroll tax, uh, but you also have the potential to layer in retirement strategies once you have earned income. So the, the math gets complicated. And I spent literally years developing worksheets to actually account for all those things and do it in a calculating the optimal amounts to take care of. Because what, what confuses a lot of people is that in a lot of cases, you actually want to pay yourself more on W-2 and raise your payroll tax in order to get a deduction on the other side. And then we can layer in, like I said, the, the, the retirement plan stuff. Okay, so that's category two, optimizing all that. Category three is once you get beyond that, if you still have $250,000 worth of, worth of taxable income, so taxable income, not just income, then there start to become what I call the exotics. And these are, these are businesses that people sell membership interests in or tax credits that people sell or there's a bunch of strategies around this. The difficulty with the exotics, this is what everybody thinks about when they think about tax strategy. The difficulty with them is that it's a case-by-case -case basis. 
you have to look at one, the particular opportunity, uh, two, the business purpose or charitable purpose or whatever purpose uh, behind that. We have people to, who have asked about conservation easements, for example. That's where you take a piece of real estate, you put a conservation easement on it, meaning that it can't be developed at any point in the future, and you get a, you get a tax credit for that. Those have gotten scrutinized a lot <laughs> because people abuse them. And so you have to be very careful about the particular opportunity that is being presented to you. Is it real? Does the property exist? Are they really doing a thing? Are their appraisals real? All those kind of stuff. And then, so that that's at the strategy level. And then at the individual levels, okay, if the strategy checks out, then how does it affect my particular case with my particular numbers? And so you have to do that analysis on a case-by-case -case basis, which is really what makes it difficult to give like a broad survey of the, um, of the exotic strategies. But by and large, those involved laying out some level of funds at a significant amount, and then taking a tax advantage on the other side, as well as some other complication down the road. <laughs> Because <laughs> they all come with their own complications uh, and not complications in the sense of something bad's going to happen, but complications in the sense that there's ongoing stuff that needs to be dealt with. So th they're not, uh, they're not easy, simple things that we just do this one thing and then we're done. Um, I know that's a broad answer to that question, but it's a broad question. <laughs>